How's it going, Woods and Forest community? I can't wait to get into this episode and talk with a professor of mine at college right now and also a mentor, Rick Hoke. But before we do that, I just want to break down what's going on. We're actually going to transition from season two to season three because we've had so many episodes and we're trying to start something new with this episode. So we're actually going to just move on and go to season three, starting with Dr. Hoke's episode. He talks about geospatial sciences, what we're learning in the departments uh, at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He talks a little bit of backstory about who he is and different things that inspired him to get into this field. And we just had a really good time talking with Dr. Hoke. I can't wait to have him come back on the podcast. So just wanted to give you guys this update. It's going to be through all four of the segments that Dr. Hoke has, and then we'll go forward accordingly. But now we're in season three, and I can't wait to share this episode with you guys. So sit back and enjoy a really awesome conversation that you can hear dialect between myself and a professor and check out what we're learning in class. But that's going to do it for this. I can't wait to see you guys. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Earlier on when you were talking about um, some of the different career paths, you're talking about like flooding and to, to kind of relate geography to say somebody who doesn't live anywhere near the woods, let's say Manhattan or better yet, um, Houston's use that as an example. A few years ago, I don't remember how many years ago they had a, that hurricane there and they had um, what 20 some feet of water in some areas where it all collected um, and I know that was a hurricane, but I would imagine some of what your field does is try to manage water. And so the more that people develop, the more that people pave roads and, and make sidewalks and have buildings, water has less and less places to go. And you get you get these flooding events, even though there's a hurricane, it's worse. Um, the water has nowhere to go. So I imagine for even someone like that, that relates what y- you guys do in some sense to somebody who lives nowhere near the woods. Yeah, we have a, I mean, Houston is a best worst case scenario right, for the United States. It's right in hurricane's path. It doesn't have any local land use planning regulations or infrastructure on purpose, right? They don't want that. They have they have these regional kind of planning districts, <laughs> uh, but they're withdrawing groundwater at a rate that's unsustainable. So what's that mean? That means the groundwater that they do have is not recharging at a rate in which it can be replaced. And so it's a net loss of groundwater. That's bad for groundwater. I mean, your water access, you're going to run out of water, but it also does another thing that allows for those soils to compact. And so Houston is sinking. Houston is sinking. So you're talking about 20 feet of water. Well, it probably wouldn't have been 20 feet of water 20 years ago because those places where uh, the water collected have been sinking. And then those places around it that you're talking about that have developed with concrete and uh, and uh, pavement and asphalt, we call that impervious surface. So you increase the amount of per- impervious surface. You take out uh, your groundwater to a, to a point where it's not recharged. And so that we call that unsustainable. And you're creating all these human made tragedies right? We know it's happening. We know the science shows that there's too much water withdrawal. The science shows that there's too much impervious surface and there's no coordination in how that's done. The science shows all of these things. And yet we continue to do that, right? So how do you create an agent of change? How do you be an agent of change to try to address that? It's urban planning. That's the urban planning process. That's the only way to do it. And so you take a conservation approach to that. You have to conserve water, Right, you have to conserve water withdrawals. You have to do different kinds of water water collection. Oh well, if we think about Houston as also a driver of change, right? What what is? I mean, I'm assuming we can agree that there's human induced climate changes happening. What's called anthropogenic climate changes, or you know, loosely called global warming, not a really good word for it. Um, but our 8 to 10 billion people on the planet soon is causing changes in the Earth's processes, right? Are we, is that natural? Maybe you want to look at it and say, well, that's natural because humans are part of the environment too. And it's just what happens when uh, 
one particular animal on this planet becomes the driving force. That's what the anthropogenic age means, right? The Anthropocene, uh, if you if you follow that. But our cities are what's doing it. Our major locations of high density human populations and the issues that you just mentioned, Josh, it's not just Houston, that's Louisiana, that's everywhere around the coast. That's all the cities around the coast. You look at Jakarta and Indonesia, they're, they're moving the capital of Indonesia to another island because Jakarta is sinking so much they don't think they can fix it. It's not resilient. It's not sustainable. It's not resilient. <laughs> They're just going to move and make a new new capital. Well, it's interesting you say that because I think a lot of people think of Chicago, L.A., and New York as these – massive cities and they are but when you act when you get out of the united states and you realize that like mexico city from a land standpoint i, I believe it's still the largest city in the world or you have tokyo as far as density some of these cities are insane uh, as far as how huge they are so i can only imagine like that type of socioeconomic impact on people but also the geography and just kind of this whole thing happening all at once and, and the geography of, of mexico city right built at the top of a mountain in a lake bed that lake bed has been drained and now it's this huge city and if you saw in the news this week they're going to run out of water in the next month they only have about four hours of water service a day for the hundreds of tens of millions of people in that region and they're claiming okay by the end of uh, x amount of weeks we're not going to have any more water to deliver to these millions of people that's a global city crisis. We have global cities, and by global city, I mean these massively huge and population-dense cities that are the drivers of climate changes. The, the amount of food they need, the amount of energy they need. Right? Most of our land use change on the planet in the last 20 years right, is not for food development, it's for energy. And I think of food as energy, right? Calories are a type of energy for humans, but it's energy for the built environment, what we call not the natural world, but the built environment. So all these places that we create uh, as cities, that's where the massive amount of change is. That's where the jobs will be in the next 50 years for students. It's dealing with energy, land use changes in cities. And for people like you guys, How's that impacting toad habitat or my access to nature and where I can hike and where can I get away from all this urbanization? So that's like the global picture of what we do. So let me, let me drive this conversation for a minute here because I, I want to get to a couple things. Uh, so I know we have enough time to, to cover them. Uh, Let's talk about NEPA and then let's let's have a conversation about the different uh, types of perspectives out there towards conservation. Uh, these were two things we learned about in your, was it regional planning class? Isn't that 625? Isn't that what the offer Well, is we called? have a, a graduate course, right? We're, we've dropped regional planning from our name and, you know, that was a 1950s term and we wanted to get rid of it for a long time, but now it's kind of making a comeback. But we're more just talking, uh, we're just calling ourselves environmental planning. Most environmental planning, okay. So uh, but that course was, yeah, it was an environmental planning course, which I focused on understanding how to do environmental impact assessment. And in, in the United States, that framework is the National Environmental Policy Act, yeah, NEPA. Yeah, I don't know, Josh, do you know what NEPA is? No. It's a big thing right now being talked about in government at the moment and um it has yeah and and there's a lot going on here but dr hoke you are talking about it in class i know josh merchko our fellow uh comrade for the hikes uh has been talking to me about it so do you want to explain just give a synopsis few a little bit of what nepa is and give us your insight on what your thoughts are like is it is it working is it not working because uh, this is going to lead into the next section. Oh, boy, that's a loaded question, huh? <laughs> uh, National Environmental Policy Act was crafted in 1969, adopted in 1970. It's really short. 
right? It's really short. Uh, it's like 13 pages, depending on how you print it. Imagine a piece of federal legislation today being 13 pages. There are thousands of pages, right? Um, so this was adopted during the time of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Surface Mining Reclamation Act wasn't long after this. So this was all these environmental federal acts that were being passed in the era. Um, and it's hard to believe that prior to 1970, there were no responsibility, there was no responsibility by a fe federal government agency to take into account what would happen to environmental resources based on what they wanted to do. For instance, one of the re reasons why NEPA was thought to be a good idea is because there was a plan hatched to use nuclear uh, bombs to uh, bomb out the some harbors in Alaska to make them more accessible to shipping. Okay, so the idea is we need better shipping lanes. Let's use nuclear bombs to, to blow up that stuff. That was actually a real idea and people thought well what what about the wildlife that didn't matter to them because they didn't care about wildlife their idea was shipping lanes right so the concept was okay we're getting to the point where we we can really make some real damage we have bombs that can do these kinds of things we have uh, earth moving machines that can really take down mountains and so there was this epiphany that we need to have an environmental policy that every federal government agency that moves dirt has to take into account its effect on the environment, that project's impact on the environment. And that's what NEPA says. That's all it says. Every, every government agency has to account for its environmental impacts for every action that it does. So anytime federal money is spent on a project that turns dirt, right, that's the term like that's a euphemism for, you know, does any kind of development. It must invokes this process, the NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act process, in which you determine what kind of impacts are going to be done. And there's different criteria and different kinds of impacts. Uh, there's no real clear assessment technique in this country. There are in other countries, uh, but there are things that must be met as per the statute. What are the primary impacts, the secondary impacts? And then there's different levels, categorical exclusion, environmental assessment, environmental impact statement, all these different kinds of procedural things that if you're an environmental planner or if you want to work in the federal government, you have to know. Every federal agency has an office for NEPA, everyone. Okay. So if you go on USA Jobs right now and type in NEPA, there'll be 100 jobs probably today. Right. And they could be for any federal agency. Federal Highways, Department of Interior, I mean, you pick it, they probably have a job opening. And it could be an environmental scientist that needs to know NEPA. It could be a community planner or a transportation planner that needs to know NEPA. It could be a biologist that needs to know NEPA. It doesn't mean that you're just stuck as this NEPA person, but you have to understand that process in your craft, whatever it is your scientific craft is. Is that what you're talking about, uh, Aaron? Is that what you wanted to know? Yeah. So what's your take on it uh with why it's become a hot topic issue in congress and with uh the house right now like why why are they trying to debate chipping away at nepa yeah um <clears throat> it takes a long time to do that kind of documentation that's required and uh right so in 2008 when we had the financial crisis and the stimulus package, there was this idea that we're going to fund shovel-ready projects. Shovel-ready projects meant that they've already been cleared by NEPA, right? They've already went through the NEPA process and they, um, and NEPA really doesn't clear anything. I shouldn't use that term. It gives you a range of alternatives and it gives you the preferred alternative, the no action alternative and, you know, various ranges of, of alternatives after that. But that doesn't even mean that the agency has to pick the preferred alternative. It's just saying this is the preferred alternative for the least amount of environmental impact based on the criteria that was chosen for this project. So it's just a series of recommendations and documentation. It really doesn't even have any bite, but it takes a long time. 
And uh, politicians don't want that, right? They, 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 they get elected every four years. They want to see projects turn around now. But you can't get rid of NEPA right now. I mean, it would be, it would be very difficult to strike NEPA down. NEPA is said to be the most copied piece of United States legislature around the world. Other countries have adopted and taken the NEPA Policy Act and adopted it as their own. In fact, they have much more stringent uh, requirements. Uh, California has their own NEPA style of process, um, and other states do as well. CEQA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act, I believe it is, um, even sets a higher bar than the federal act. And under um, Mr. Trump's administration, he he tried to the the, the the Department of Justice tried to say that they that you couldn't. I believe I'm not I'm not an expert on this that you couldn't have a state act that that was had higher quality higher standards than the federal act. And I don't believe that was found to be that way. So you can't have state acts that are have even a higher bar. But Democrat, Republican, I don't play into any of that. They all want to get rid of it. They don't like the idea that you have to take all this time to do this environmental documentation and impact. They want to see money spent, projects done, build it, build it, drill it, whatever it is they want to see. Environmental impact assessment in the NEPA process is supposed to slow that down. It's supposed to say, do we need this project? Is this money well spent? Right? And that's the whole purpose of it is what is what you say is to stop project inertia or project momentum. Some local politician or state politician says, you know, we need we need a new highway. We build this highway, it's going to be great. And everybody just starts saying, Senator so-and-so wants this new highway. And then the project just starts rolling like a bowling ball. And maybe you don't need that highway. Maybe the highway is a bad idea. Maybe it's a boondoggle. Maybe it has a huge environmental impact. And the NEPA process is built to stop that fast inertia and say, let's look at this. And that's why they don't like it. Okay. Puts the brakes on their projects. I don't hear you. I'll give you a second to respond to that, Josh, uh, before we kind of go into phase two of this. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, man. I'm I'm gonna be honest. There's uh I didn't realize how I mean I guess it makes sense the government would have a pretty big role in some of this stuff and, and like the logistics that you guys have to deal with, but I don't know, that, that that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I worked on a a NEPA project when I was in, in university and um one of the faculty was chair of our department. He, he was leading some of this, and we were doing some of this work in our lab, uh, putting a power line across two national forests. Big electronic electric transmission line had to go through the Mon National Forest and the Washington Jefferson National Forest. You can't just do that, right? That is a publicly owned resource. And for private industry, to be going through there, you, you you can't just allow that to happen. It has to go through a process. And so private industry doesn't like the process. Many politicians don't like the process because it slows down what they want to see done. Um, one thing I'll just say about it, we asked about my personal opinion about it. I can see some things being fast-tracked, and the, there is a process for fast-tracking things called a categorical exclusion. Some kinds of projects like bridge replacement. If you have a small little bridge replacement and federal funds are being used, do you have to do a big study? No. You know what that project is every time you do it. It's categorically excluded from further assessment. So there, there are built-in assessments. But it's a 1970s era mentality. It's an end of the pipe mentality in pollution prevention and conservation, like the NPDES permit process, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System of how to reduce pollution. It's it's trying to regulate pollution where it comes out into our environment. That's the, an old fashioned way of thinking. We probably need new ways of doing this. Right? Uh, and we do need new ways of doing this. The problem is how do you get that into a federal policy without opening up the, the 
the act where people can gut it. Once you open it up, people can start to gut it. You can amend it, but if you open it up to change it, then, then it can be gutted. So there's there's a lot of political politics involved that we don't really deal with, but um, I think it's important for students to understand the National Environmental Policy Act process because every federal agency needs to do that. And if federal funds are used even as a pass through through state agency, right? So federal funds are passed through to states and they use those funds, NEPA processes and both. And it's just good, it's a good process to understand how something might impact the natural world or the cultural world. So let me ask you just rapid fire questions, just one one sentence or something like that. Yeah, yeah nothing, I promise. Nothing major. Uh all right. What's your favorite class to teach? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> the I'm ones sick. you're in, Aaron. He'll say I plead the fifth. <laughs> the ones I'm not I, in, right? I, I, the, the one I really like is is the thought and philosophy course. Other than that, if that so that's more of a and I know this isn't a one sentence. I like thought and philosophy. We understand the way we learn in uh, geography and planning. But uh, in terms of applied science, it's the watershed management land use class. I like that class. Land use, okay. Uh, <laughs> what is GIS? <laughs> <laughs> Points, Geogra lines, and polygons, right? Systems. Oh, yeah. It's a, yeah. Uh, the, the data you use, it's nothing but points, lines, polygons, and cells. Right? That's all you got to. That's all you got to think about. Uh, what's the best place? What's the best state to move to to start a career in geospatial data interpretation? Um, well, at Geospatial Intelligence uh, Hub is in St. Louis and in Springfield, Virginia. So if you're into working for the federal government in any kind of geospatial intelligence, I'd say those two places, right? Springfield, Virginia, which is outside of DC and St. Louis, that's their two hubs um, for federal work. And in the remote sensing industry, it's mostly in uh, Denver, Colorado. Right? Most, uh, a lot of aerial uh, image companies and satellite image companies are in located in, in Denver. Why? It's the center of the country. There's a lot of Air Force things there, and they get the most amount of cloud-free days in in, uh, in the United States. All right. All right. Last one. Favorite drone? I like our new wing drone. <laughs> <Wait. laughs> um, uh, I have a Mavic 3 that I use for my own personal use, a DJI product. Um, you know, I have the first one we built right here. And it looks like an antique now, right? So this was our octocopter that we built with the NASA GPS on there. And you know, we couldn't really make ortho imagery, but we, we built this as a kit. This was the first UAV that we, uh, that we uh, had in the department and it was called a storm drone. But I, I, uh, I would say my favorite new thing is this thing called a dragon drone, if you've ever seen it. Check yeah, it out. Check on it out. Check it out. On YouTube. It's it's a drone that it's like uh, if you could think of a, a spine, okay, and it can move like a snake in the air, huh. right? So it can go around corners and through crevices and snake its way in the air, and also change its its location of each kind of rotary. As it, this is super neat. And um, really good for different kinds of emergency situations. We're gonna have to ask Ben Hart if he knows what that is, but uh, <laughs> he's coming on next week, so okay. that'll be fun. Any any question? One one uh, sentence question you think we should ask Ben Hart? <laughs> well, that I I don't know how far I can go on that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I worked in um, in doing things with the government and as a federal agency, at a you know, and I ran a remote sensing shop and a geospatial shop. Uh, it was called under our grant. It was an EPA grant, Region Three grant. It was called the uh, Mid Atlantic Office for Sustainability Decision Support, or something like that. It was some some kind of weird name like that, and. So my experience was 
I mean, I was super lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. I knew the right people. I got the job. And I worked with a lot of great people. I learned from a lot of great people, people above me and below me. Um, so I had a great experience. And I, I try to bring that to the classroom. Um, you know, John has similar experiences, but he has a lot more academic experience. So I don't know what the best question to ask him is. Maybe, you know, what's his vertical jump? <laughs> ask him what his highest vertical is. <laughs> That's going to be what we start out with. Because he's a good bas he was a good basketball player. I mean, he probably still is a good basketball player, but he was, you know, the big man. We got to get a highlight clip of him, like, throwing one down, like he's got to dunk it. Yeah. That's how we'll do his intro. Okay. Yeah. That's the time Dr. Hook wants to know what your best vertical. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to add that in. Um, <laughs> so let me sign off here, and then uh, we could chat for a second, or if you got to go, you can go. Uh, but anyway. What a great night. What an exciting discussion we had with Dr. Hoke. Uh, hopefully you guys can see the passion and the excitement that he has for teaching classes. I know this was something that I had the chance to experience up close and in person for multiple classes. And it's been great to learn from the geography department at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Really excited to continue to work with you, Dr. Hoke, on some of these different geospatial projects that I'm doing and getting your advice and even possibly reaching out to you as a sort of a consultant for the nonprofit, a little bit more hands-off, but. Yeah, I'm looking forward to doing some analysis for what you guys do. I mean, that's really what is interest to me the most is doing the analysis. I mean, I love going out and collecting the data and getting it, but that data capture, right? Then what do you do with it? So exploiting it, um, uh, making things happen with it right? and how does it influence change i want to make positive change in the world i don't know what gets you up in the morning right it makes you feel like i'm going to get up and go do something today uh but what i think of is you know how can i make something better today maybe someone's life maybe habitat maybe a decision right so that's what inspires me i guess i mean i had a you know that's a standard question in an interview what motivates you? Those are the kind of things that motivate me. So, yeah, if you have any projects, I'd love to work on stuff. Like that. Yeah, and I hope to you know, see you around, Josh. Nice meeting you. Yeah, nice Maybe meeting you. Thank you. Someday, right? I'm, do, right? I'm planning on a trip, uh, another Laurel Highlands uh, trip. I haven't done that for a while. Yeah, I'm doing uh, Ohio Powell to Seven Springs. I'm like going the whole way, whole way back uh, over the fourth. Um, the reason being is I, i'm not sure how like physically i'm you know if i'm able to actually go for five days straight or five nights and six days whatever it would take have you done it before the laura hines trail not that not that far no so i'm going with somebody who's out in texas right now I, I i wanted to bring it up where he was at it's one of the national parks out there hiking um and so i'm with somebody that i feel knows what he's doing and um can help plan and get the right gear and stuff like that. I have a good bit of gear, but he can definitely polish it up. Well, if you bit. want to talk gear one day. <laughs> yeah. I have way too many titanium cook sets. That I there you go. Right? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm all about that in stoves. And but if, if I can, this is unsolicited and I don't like to do this, but I've done that section of that trail half a dozen times. And the first time I learned, don't do it south to north start at the north and move yeah. south because the elevation drops right, right. You're going into the Ohio, into the yawk valley and you're going up to johnstown so if you're going to go from seven springs or from high to seven springs do it start at seven springs and yeah. go. To, you hit the dollies right they call them the dollies there's two big hills dolly parton right the two big dollies on that section of trail and even though they're, you're going up and down, right? And you think, well, it's the same up and down. No, no, it's up and down on a on an elevation slant. Sure. You're still, you know, from Seven Springs to High Pile, you're going down in elevation. Yeah. You start here, <laughs> it's a heck of a walk. Yeah, my friend likes to torture me. That might be why I have to talk with him. We're, <laughs> we're still planning it out, but it's definitely happening. And I took off work for it and all this good stuff so <laughs> oh, i love the through hike from johnstown 
and then you stop at Seven Springs and you get a hotel room and you you know you get in the hot tub and you get a nice yeah. meal and then you finish the walk. That's yeah. a great way to do it. It's a lot of fun that way. Sure, <laughs> especially makes you really grateful for the hotel too. Oh, you love, you love it. You love a good meal and a nice hot tub, man. On those yeah, uh, two days out on the trail or three. You know, you can do it in three days or two days. Those ultra marathoners do it and they run that thing in like twelve hours. Wow. <laughs> or something imagine. insane they do it really fast you know wow. i had to hike it it took me five days to hike or four days to hike. yeah we want to do you that stop. hike yeah um, you stop at the lean twos they're great you know they have all the water for you or the water yeah. pumps you yeah. have all the firewood you know the, the adirondack lean twos they're fantastic can we get you to come back at some point in the summer and do a part two after the, after school lets out yeah yeah. We'll do. We'll feature it more about hiking then. Yeah, I love hiking, and I've I've taken up tenkara uh, style Japanese fishing, and so, you know, that's my favorite thing. Get up in those headwaters and just I just all I do is fish for those little native rookies, man. That's it. Those those colonies have been up there for centuries, you know, and spawning and creating, and I always put them back, of course. Um, but it's a great way to hike. It's like you're saying, have a destination, Josh. Just to throw in that line, ten car fishing is there's no reel. It's just like stack pole fishing on a telescopic rod. It's, it, you only need this much equipment. Really lightweight. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, guys, that's going to do it for this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and come back to see part two of Doctor Hoke mm -hmm. in the all seasons cch merger here of a hiking part of our podcast but we'll see you guys in the next one thank you maybe we'll show some data uh next time huh share some screens and show some data there we, we go do that. let's do that next time huh? get technical